Edward likely frequented every single one of the high-class cat houses in Paris, but his preference and most frequented was by far the infamous Le Chabonnet. He stayed so regularly, he actually had his own room, complete with his coat of arms over the bed and an elaborate copper bathtub with a massive half-woman, half-swan figurehead. Years later, Salvador Dali bought the bathtub for 112,000 francs. Le Chabonnet speedily became a home away from home for the prince, and let's just say, he got very relaxed there. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Thanks to Edward VII, Le Chabonnet included one of the most infamous pieces of furniture in history, the love chair. Made from only the best quality wood and upholstery, Edward's love seat looked strange. It looked uncomfortable to sit in, but that's because it wasn't designed for sitting. It was designed for his late night antics. Women were Edward's favourite hobby, but he had a lot more to go around. Second on the list was perhaps his love for food, and by the 1880s, Edward had grown his waistline in line with his appetite. His ginormous stomach had begun to intrude on his bedroom antics, so he had a famous cabinet maker, Louis Soubria, design and make the love chair to enable him to continue to appreciate the fruits of the working girls, sometimes several at once, despite his considerable girth. Edward enjoyed a good time more than just about anyone in England, and he didn't limit his luxuries to just women. The prince adored his food as well, and reportedly ate five whole meals a day, most of them gluttonous ten-course extravaganzas, and of course, he needed copious amounts of boudet and champagne to wash it all down with. By the time he finally became king, Edward's waistline had ballooned to 48 inches. No wonder he needed that special chair. Although publicly, the Victorians were viewed as being prim, proper and suppressed people. Behind closed doors, they were debauched, full of affairs, gambling and drinking. Edward's debauchery had only just begun, and there's another crazy story about him. If you attended the Parisian nightlife in the 1880s and 90s, there was a high possibility that you would bump into Edward sooner or later. While he loved Le Chabonnet and his love chair, he knew that variety was the spice of life. He also loved the city's nightclubs, particularly the renowned Moulin Rouge, where he would regularly be seen with a new French socialite or actress on his arm every week. Compared to the grim and depressing London, where the shadow of his mother and her perpetual mourning hung over him, it's not surprising that Edward spent so much of his time in Paris. Despite all of his naughty antics in Paris, he did have a very large family to look after back home, and he still managed to juggle his family life with his naughty chairs and burlesque shows. It is shocking that while he was living his best life, living as an eligible bachelor, that he was in fact married with a family. He had a whole brood of kids back in England, and evidently his constant affairs didn't keep Edward from his marital duties. Notwithstanding his infidelity, Edward and his wife, Alex, had six children together, starting with the eldest, Prince Albert Victor. What can we say? Victorians were weird. By all accounts, Princess Alexandra was supposedly fine with her husband's womanising. But then, what choice did she have? She is said to have welcomed several of the mistresses into their home and even acknowledged them in public. While it's entirely possible she buried her resentment deep down, these are Victorians that we're talking about. After all, every account seems to show that Alec was totally fine with it. 
Edward sounds arduous to live with and to be with romantically. Maybe it was just easier for her to accept than resist. They are reported to have remained friends even while Edward was womanising his way through Paris, but their lives were not absent of tragedy. Edward and Alexandra had six children. Their sixth and final child, Prince Alexander, John, passed away just a day after he was born. This left the couple devastated and they would not go on to have any more children. Agreeing to reports of that sad day, Edward individually laid their boy in his tiny casket, with tears rolling down his cheeks. This tragic loss of a child would not be the only loss they would experience, and it wasn't long until they were having to bury yet another one of their children. Not even Edward could keep up his playboy antics forever. Perhaps his age caught up to him, but in 1890, Edward confessed to his son, George, that he was finally getting too old for these amusements. That did not mean that he gave up all of his debauched behaviour and he maintained relationships with various mistresses until the day that he passed away. He just slowed down a little. However, he clearly had an addictive personality and the absence of hundreds of women in his life just left for more time for other bad habits. Another bad habit that he enjoyed was gambling. It was Edward's style to get tangled up in yet another scandal, and this was no different. Despite his numerous trips to Paris, Edward had in some way survived a few years without a major public scandal, but all of that was about to change. In 1890, he attended boys' night with other high-flying members of society at the home of one Arthur Wilson for some friendly high-stake baccarat. There were just two problems. First of all, the game was absolutely illegal. And secondly, Wilson caught one of Edward's friends, Sir William Corden Cumming, cheating. Although this friendly night seems like a small-time offence, this incident reflected very badly on Edward, and it didn't just blow over like you would expect. It would unravel to be one of the biggest scandals to rock the royal family in years, when he had to attend court. Gordon Cumming, like a lot of people who were caught cheating, went into defensive mode. He angrily exploded on his accusers and demanded a retraction of their accusations. Tempers were heightened and the debacle ended up in court. This was bad enough for Edward because everybody knew that he was there that night, but it was about to get a whole heap worse. The scandal was intensified for Edward because he was called as a witness to testify. This was the first time any English court had called an heir to their throne to stand trial in over 400 years. Due to his association with this man, Gordon Cumming, that the court found guilty of cheating, his reputation took a massive hit. The Victorians were extremely judgy and would cancel anybody who went against the status quo. In retaliation to the man's actions, he was kicked out of the army and completely ostracised him from public society. The public were angry at the prince but being the best charmer of England, the people weren't going to stay mad at him for long. Edward had caused his parents a lot of pain with his rebellious behaviour, and unfortunately for Edward, he had created his own problem child too. His eldest son, Prince Albert Victor, was next in line to the throne after Edward. It appears that the young prince took after his father, because when Albert Victor grew into a young man, Rumours began to spread about him too, and he became the new form of gossip for the people. He became nearly as scandalous as Edward, with rumours spreading about his wild affairs, rumours that he was a male prostitute, as well as strange rumours that he was secretly Jack the Ripper. But then, tragedy struck. Prince Albert Victor, at a very young age of only 27, 
when in the prime of his life, the influenza pandemic of 1889 ravaged England. Pandemics do not discriminate against one class, and senior and poor classes alike suffered. The strapping young prince fell victim to the disease before passing from pneumonia on the 14th of January 1892. And Edward's heartbreaking letters reveal just how devastated he was. Though the relationship between Edward and Queen Victoria had always been strained, the loss of Albert Victor at least brought them closer together for a time. In the following days after Albert's passing, Edward surprisingly wrote to his mother, To lose our eldest son is one of those calamities one can never get over. I would have given my life for him, as I put no value on mine. It took a few years for Edward to get back on his womanising wagon that he was accustomed to. He met Alex Keppel, a woman 26 years his senior. Even at 56 years old, Edward was still the same old dirty rascal, and Keppel rapidly became his new mistress. There was something special about Alice Keppel. She was different to his usual mistresses, and they had an arrangement. Keppel had at least one thing going for her in Edward's eyes. She was married, and this was evidently something that the prince enjoyed. He started visiting her at her home at 30 Portsmouth Square. Her husband would make himself scarce for these royal visits. Her husband perhaps knew that he could benefit financially from having informant with the heir. Edward was inclined to treat the women who shared his bed exceptionally well, sometimes even after their affairs ended. He couldn't just flat out give Alex Keppel money for the privy purse. But instead, Edward gave her shares in a rubber company. She earned a cool 50,000 out of the deal, which is about seven and a half million pounds today. Even her poor husband got something out of the arrangement when Edward found him a new job with a better salary. Eating five different 10 course meals a day can't be healthy but neither is smoking 20 cigarettes and 12 cigars daily, but that didn't stop Edward. Edward truly lived the motto, we're here for a good time, not a long time. But despite his plumpness and smoking like a chimney, Edward clearly never had trouble finding the ladies. No, the trouble came after he found them, and the scandals did not stop coming. He went on to start dating Lady Randolph Churchill, which is Winston Churchill's mother. Join me in part four to learn about his affair with Lady Churchill, as well as his final days as king, and how his wife and mistresses reacted to his death. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.